International. On the last hour, we listened to John Rayner playing the flute, um, Northern Plains from the album Songs of the Indian Flute, Laura Ortman, opening ceremony, and we just finished with three songs, The Cult for the Animals, Electric Gin, Deer Crossing, and The Handsome Savages, Cry of the Cannibals. So this segment is called Downstown Stories, and we have three guests with us for this hour. I'll introduce them, and then we can begin talking. It's going to be a nice crosstalk conversation, and hopefully we'll learn a lot of new things and ways of um, thinking. My first guest is Stephen Englander. Stephen, I've known you for maybe since about 2004. Yeah. I've known you as the director of uh, the downtown arts organization, ABC No Rio, which was currently formerly on Rivington Street and is now undergoing a capital uh, renovation project. Um, to your right is Nancy Azara. Nancy, I've known you since about 2001, and we go back even further as an artist to about 1995, when I was a student at, at UT Texas, and I wrote a review of your excellent exhibition in, in one of the university galleries there. You're actually one of the first friends I made in New York City, so Ooh. thank both of you, thank you. And sitting to my left is Zenobia Bailey, who I've known just a few short weeks, but I've actually gotten to know quite a bit about you through Maria telling me about you. Um, it would be great if each of you spent a few minutes just telling us uh, what you're up to, what you're doing, um, how you came to New York, and then we could de develop a more uh, involved discussion. Uh, Zenobia, would you like to start? Okay. Um, you want me to start with what I'm up to now? Sure. Okay. Thanks. Well, right now I'm an uh, artist in residence at the um, Museum of Art and Design on 59th Street in Columbus Circle with Maria. We're studio mates. Um, and... Um, what brought me to New York, I came to New York um, through school. I was studying um, industrial design. Um, I'm from Seattle, Washington, and I needed to come to New York because they have a larger African-American community here. Um, Seattle has a very small um, African-American com community, although we had an African-American mayor, you know, so that was like some work. <laughs> but anyway... Um, I came to New York to be in a, a larger African-American community because I, I just needed to have the urban experience since African-Americans have lost our culture, so we have to kind of reconstruct it now. So that's pretty much what I'm doing now. My medium is crochet. So after your, your Museum of Art and Design residency, you're going back to Seattle? Oh, no. I, I live in, um, I kind of live in Philly and New York. Okay. You so know? The, 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 what is it, the sixth borough? Is that what they yeah. Yeah, so I'll be, you know, I'll, I'll still be in town pretty much. Right. Thank you. Oh, you have a talk. Oh, I have a talk today, right. It was a conversation with um, a young writer, an amazing writer, um, Sharifa Rhodes. She, we've been in um, conversation and she's been doing articles on me for a few years now, so it's just a continuation of the conversation we've had going on. We haven't seen each other for a few years, uh, well, a few months. We had like a three-hour conversation a few months ago, but that's all. That doesn't count, you know, so we're going to be catching up with... And, and your talk is where? At the Museum of Art and Design at 4 o'clock. Okay, thank you. Um, Nancy, how are you doing? I'm good. So you brought some stuff with you, too, and I'm really curious about the stuff. But before we get into that, um, what's going on with you? Uh, well, let's see. I live nearby, which I think is an interesting and relevant part. And in fact, I brought my dog because Jason loves my dog. And he's a Japanese Shiba Inu. And uh, he's here very quiet and silent and very attentive and listening very well here. Uh, I am a sculptor. I'm a wood carver. I work in large pieces, but I also work in smaller ones so that people can own work and go and uh, hang them in their homes and become acquainted with the work. And then the larger work is more public. I've been carving for a long time. It was my pleasure to meet Jason in, I've forgotten how long ago it was. Jason, I think, remembers. He's better at dates, but I'm not as good as him. Um, so in Arlington, Texas, I had an exhibition and this young man came and interviewed me about the show. And I thought, wow, he asked some very interesting questions. And he was an undergraduate, and I remembered him. And about 10 years later, was it, Jason? You got in touch with me. 
and you sent me an email and you said that you're now in New York and you too had remembered. However, you weren't sure if I remembered you. And I did, of course. And so um, it was very nice how you worded this, the email. You said, um, I would love to get together just for conversation. And I thought that was great because that's wonderful. And I don't have enough of that in my life. I don't think artists in general today converse to, and have an interchange with each other. And I miss it. Um, so I seek it out. I do a group called Represent, uh, which is a meeting of younger artists and older artists, women artists, to discuss the differences and the similarities, and to discuss some of the antagonism that has, over the years, developed between the younger generation of women artists and the older generation. Because as the younger generation has said, we don't understand why these older women are so angry at us. It's not our fault we get the museums, the galleries, and the grants. So, of course, it's not their fault, but uh, they felt entitled to something that we didn't even begin to understand or see as a possibility for ourselves. Uh, so, this group has been meeting for a long time. I was just going over some things, and I think we've been meeting maybe 10 years, and uh, we discuss what our similarities and differences are, something very simple, but it brings us together. Do you believe, I mean, in my mind, it's hard for me to believe that a lot of these young women don't, didn't know we did phone chains. They, don't know, they didn't know what a mimeograph machine was. I mean, why don't you just email? Well, let me tell you, 20 years ago, we didn't have such a thing. So there's this um, kind of uh, quality of exchange. And then I've been showing my work a lot. And the last large um, piece, uh, which is 12 feet long, by about five feet high, which is a vine, and that was shown in New Hampshire at the, um, um, at a, at a park, large parks department place. And uh, I always get him mixed up with Calvert Bow. I can't tell you. Uh, he's, a, he's a sculptor, and uh, he left his property to the government. And so it was a beautiful show, and it was all white. I wanted to see what it would be like to work with the concept of, of white and shadow. Mm. So I think that's enough. That's, that's, well, thank you, Nancy. That's really interesting. And we are going to talk about this. Oh, um, okay. So well, Stephen, what, what's, what's going on? Um, so I'm currently the administrator at ABC No Rio, the director, um, a position I've held since 1999. Um, but I actually first came to New York in 1978, and I was in the film program at NYU, and subsequently worked in the uh, industry for gosh, maybe 15 years on and off. Also, my entree to sort of ABC No Rio was through activism, um, which I've done on and off. New York City, you can have various incarnations of yourself, and that is the case with me, although the one I seem to have been settling into is that of administrator. Um, and now project uh, construction manager. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, my entree to ABC No Rio was in the, uh, the sort of late 80s. Um, at the time, on the Lower East Side, there was a huge amount of political dynamism going on, mostly related to things that never seemed to leave, gentrification, land use policies, um, and the squatters movement that was going on at the time. And um, I think my initial role at ABC No Rio was to try to connect the programming that was going on there with uh, more street level political activism rather than political artwork that existed conceptually, like get the stuff tied directly to the activists themselves, the squatter movement itself, and street protest. Um, so that's what sort of my entree into ABC No Rio was, you know, through activism, not necessarily directly through art. That's interesting. So one of the things, actually, there's several themes have arrived just by hearing everyone talk. Um, one of them was that Nancy had mentioned the a generational difference in, in operating. And I know ABC No Rio operates on a, on a volunteerism. And I'm, and I'm involved with ABC No Rio and the visual arts and the board. And one of the things that we have for is just showing up. You have to be there in person. You can't. And you know, oftentimes you've mentioned that um, sometimes other artists think they can just email the stuff in. Or there's an application system. And no, you, just, you have to be present. And I, I see that reflected in the way Nancy talks, the way you've talked. Um, but also, it generally, these kinds of volunteerism or being there in person is what creates an artistic community. 
and you mentioned the same thing. You were looking for a particular, you know, a larger community for yourself, and rather than, and you felt you had to be there in person to be a part of it. Um, it would be interesting to hear you guys talk about your involvement, like once either in trying to transition communities or um, the changing community around you over time, which you've talked about, Nancy, to some extent, but as a, in, a, in terms of person to person. But also just um, maybe do you, do you think it's important that this continue to be a kind of in-person situation for community building, or do you think it can be done remotely, especially as we're connected now more than ever uh, digitally? Do you have any thoughts on those kinds of things? Um, I think it's um, very important to be um, in a community, you know, uh, personally, because I um, I come from uh, Seattle, Washington, uh, is um, the most native culture there is the um, Snoqualmish and the Pacific Island people. And so um, that was pretty much something that I picked up from there, and I could have never um, picked up what I got from being in those communities, especially as a child, um, if I wasn't there. So, um, and when I was in Seattle, the experience of the African American um, cultures across the country was from the media and books and magazines, and it wasn't real because when I got here and I went to Harlem for the very first time, I was shocked. I, I'd never been in a large population of African-American people before, so I had to adapt to that, you know. I went to major culture shock, and it was it was a good shock because I would sit on, um, like, in, like in Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn, um, in Albee Square, I would just sit on the sidewalk and just look at the black people going back and forth and like it was a parade and people didn't know what I was looking at but I've never seen that many. And me and my um, niece one time, we went to a Knicks game just to see the black people <laughs> coming and going. So I think it's very important um, to be in, you know, to be present because you can read about it and, you know, um, uh, look at different media and but you can't get the full experience from being mm. there. Zenobia, can you maybe talk a little bit about the way that your practice is connected with other disciplines? Like you've worked a lot with poets, you, your work itself, you've termed it as functional, with a K, functional design. Um, maybe you can address some of those other communities as well. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, when I was in school and studying design, I studied industrial design and we, we were studying the history of design. And when we were studying the history of de design of North America, we didn't cover anything about African Americans or any indigenous people or anything, really. It just was um, a Western aesthetic that came from um, um, Germany, really, um, from the Bauhaus. But um, so when I asked my instructor, what about, you know, um, the cultures from the United States, the design cultures from the United States, the material culture from the United States? And he told me there was no such thing. So I said, yes, there was, because I was raised in, in a culture like that. So when I, I did graduate from school, and um, when I got out, I had to, um, I'm developing this aesthetic called functional design. It's functional with a K and it comes from the African-American um, material culture right after emancipation because when we were emancipated, we didn't have anything. We were just left to go with what was on our backs and, and what we knew. So we would make things from bones, stones, sticks, mud, you know, whatever, and re a lot of recycling, repurposing um, um, of material culture. So that's where the funk aesthetic came from, and then our music came from that, our poetry and um, our storytelling all came from that, that whole um, emerging from uh, emag emancipation, I mean, yeah, um, enslavement into like sharecropping and, and Jim Crow, and you know, it, it was a constantly living this um, dream and a nightmare. That's what funk is to me, living a dream and a nightmare. Wow. So the, the, in my aesthetic of funk, I don't know if that's other people's aesthetic of my, um, and then the beautiful thing about funk 
it's whatever you say it is for you that's it that's that's what it is you know so um that's um let's see and then i started out when i was in school i was working with wood i was doing furniture and uh, wooden furniture and toys and they all have an african-american an african in north america aesthetic i wasn't trying to do an aesthetic from Nigeria or Senegal or Ghana or anything. It was definitely North American aesthetic, you know. Um, and um, so I was dealing with the wildlife here, with the animals um, that I was um, carving out of the wood. But when I got out of school, um, I didn't have the power tools. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also, when I was in Seattle, when I was living in Seattle, when I... When I decided that I wanted to come to college, I wanted to um, 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 major in sculpture. And in Seattle, it's it's a luxury to uh, work in sculpture because you can go to the mountains and get your alabaster and your soapstones and all your driftwoods. We have beautiful wood there, so I didn't have to buy anything. So I said, oh, I'm going to major in in sculpture so when I got to New York I found out I had to buy all this stuff you know so I had to change my major real quick you know so um, I had access to wood I can buy you know smaller pieces. I was doing like mock-ups and stuff I can buy smaller pieces of wood I didn't deal with the the stones anymore because that was too expensive but um, I um, switched from um, the wood work because I didn't have a studio so I was working in my apartment I had sawdust all over the ceiling and everywhere because I was sanding and all that in my studio so I saw somebody a woman on the train one time um, crocheting and I asked her what she was doing and she said she was crocheting she was a costume designer for a dance company I said wow you can do your work while you're traveling she said yeah so um, I decided to switch to crochet right then you know I said next time I learn how to crochet I'm, I mean see somebody that can cro crochet I'm gonna learn and I found this amazing woman at uh, um, uh, the residency that I was at um, in Greenpoint and um, she taught me how to crochet she didn't she could read patterns but she told me don't don't learn how to read patterns because like some of them are wrong anyway she taught me how to crochet but I could look at whatever I wanted to make and I could make it or if whatever I imagined I could make it so and she taught me everything I needed to know in three days you know so uh, Nobi, I really love the way that um, the with your materials, accessibility, the mobility, all of those elements around the materiality with the medium that you work with in terms of crocheting. I'm wondering maybe, Nancy, could we um, hear from you? Well, actually, I have a, I have a couple of other things for, to pile on for you, Nancy. Um, we were talking about communities, and Zenobia mentioned that she needed to be there in person and come here in person. And I'm looking at a picture you have on our table of you wearing those pink pussy caps. <laughs> where it seems like you had to go somewhere too to be a part of something. Um, and then of course, yeah, definitely the, uh, there's, there's several things in my head at once. It's, un it's unfortunate for you because I have so many things. Um, but I remember we were talking about downtown and Zenobia was talking about working in her apartment. Remember we were walking down, what was the street? It wasn't Essex. Was it Essex Street? Oh no, it was, I lived on Forsyth Street. I had Forsyth a, Street, right. I had a storefront on Forsyth Street. And that was in 1963, 64. My mother used to cry all the time. She couldn't believe that I could live like this. And I'm Italian-American, so all the old Italians started out by living there. And then they moved, and they were so proud of themselves. They moved into, you know, suburbs of Brooklyn, really. I mean, they didn't, right. many of them went from, Brook, from there you're, to you're Brooklyn. You're from Brooklyn. I'm right? sorry? But you're, and you're from Brooklyn, right? Well, yeah, I was born yeah. in Brooklyn because they moved to Brooklyn. Oh. And they were so proud of themselves. They had little houses and gardens and vegetables. And uh, I, I grew up, um, I was born just before World War II. So I grew up uh, during World War II. And they had victory gardens. And, um, and the angst that the Italian-Americans have I had at the time, I remember, because their country was... Uh, opposed to the United States, and they had very strong feelings about both places. 
Um, they actually had loved Mussolini when he started. I mean, this is not an uncommon uh, right. thing. I'm not saying something that's unusual to history. Um, in general, acknowledged, it's acknowledged. Um, and then they felt, th I guess the only thing they could do to acknowledge how he had deceived them and disappointed them and done some cruel, horrible things was to say he, he was good because he built the roads and he... Kept the trains uh, running on time. Kept the trains running on time. Thank you, Jason. That's exactly what they said. And then he lost control over what he was doing. Or, you know, he got a little crazy, and then they were very upset because they didn't really believe in um, the well, idea of bonding with the Germans or that kind of thing. But getting, getting back to yeah, your apartments. Back to, yeah, uh, um, my apartments. I remember we were walking by, and yeah. we were like, oh, I never locked the door. Can you, what was that story? I can't quite remember that one. You used to never lock the door because people would always break in. Oh, I yeah. think if you locked mm -hmm. the door, you'd lose the door. So it was easier yeah. just to keep it unlocked. Let Something of that version. Right, right. Um, but I got a big dog because every time the police would come, they would say, why don't you have a dog? Because I live there alone. And the kids used to jump up and down because I had the whole part, of the, uh, uh, three quarters of the storefront covered. And the kids used to jump up and down in the street so they could see me and wave because there's a park across the street. Um, but it was great for carving because I, the whole little front of the storefront and that's how I started. I fell in love with carving, but I've always been in love with trees. So I carved stone and I carved wood. But the problem with the stone was I just didn't fall in love with it, you know. And the stone carvers would say, I'd say, it's too cold. This, I, I just don't love stone. And the stone carvers would try to talk me out of that by saying, well, when you carve stone for a while and you get used to it, it gets nice and warm. I said, great for you. But I, I've always been in love with trees. And so... As I began to continue to become a sculptor, I continued to work carving trees, uh, dead trees. I mean, not ones that were alive. But they didn't have, they weren't really dead. I mean, they had their spirit and their life in them. And I would um, try to embrace that. So my work was really about the embracing and the communication. Jason's talking about communication. In that way, there's also the communication with your art, you know, with your materials. And um, so I lived, I've lived in three storefronts, and I was, uh, I was thrilled when I finally moved up. I lived in NoHo for a while, 20 years, and when I finally moved upstairs, because I had a top floor, and it was very sunny, and it was just beautiful, and so it wasn't a storefront anymore. And then I moved to right here in Tribeca, so... You literally live one block away. I, yes, I do. On Franklin. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of great yeah. to kind of just <laughs> bring the dog over, as yeah. I said I was going to do. Yeah. So, um, well, I do feel uh, that I lacked community. And when I was a young artist, uh, women didn't really, I mean, if you went up to a group of men who were artists too, and you were having a conversation, they were having a conversation, and you made a comment, because the conversation often was interesting, they would stop talking and often they would walk away. They would disassemble, disassemble and walk away and have little mini conversations together with themselves. Um, so there was no real connection to that. And if you went out with your friends, women friends, to a bar, um, they would try to break in on the whole thing and say hello, thinking of themselves as much more important than our discussion about art. So when the women's movement started in about 1970, 68, 69, but in 1970, well, 68, I was in a woman's group, and then 1970, I was in a woman's group, um, which became a much more, I mean, all the women's groups were very important and powerful, but the one that started in 1970 uh, lasted for a long time, and we were able, we were artists, so we were able to touch on uh, different things, but not interior things, more exterior, where are you shown, um, who have you met? I was less interested in that and not able to really keep up with them. And sometimes I wonder why. Is it because I wasn't interested, which I think was a big factor, because I didn't know yet what I want, who I was. I mean, I, maybe painters know quicker. You know, maybe sculptors, it takes longer. I, I wonder. But I was so interested in connecting to the profound that I wasn't really able to um, think of of, the, of myself as the idea of a, a professional shower, you know, artist who shows a lot. Um, but I listened, and it was, 
sort of interesting, it was also sort of hard, because my feeling about my work was very different. Okay. Um, so you were just talking about art and materials. So let's talk about art and materials with this. You brought something, and you, I think you wanted to talk to Maria about it. And then um, we'll spend a little time on this, and then we'll go to Stephen for a little bit. Um, well, I brought this because, well, let me say first that, let me say first that I am convinced that if I hadn't seen Native art, and if I hadn't seen art from other cultures, um, well, Native art, of course, is from this culture, but if I hadn't seen art from other cultures, like from India, I don't think I would have been an artist. Um, crocheting and fabric stuff was really badly dismissed. And my back, when I was young, and my background is a costume designer for the theater. So I knew all, a lot about the Bauhaus, and I had really worked with that imagery and felt very connected to it. And felt it was genuine, valuable, and really they were looking for something. I didn't feel that about a lot of the art that was around. So I uh, began to study at length Native culture. And so today, because we are, um, uh, I've been invited by uh, two Native peoples, I brought my twins. Um, I have a collection of different um, beautiful beaded works. and. I had asked Maria a couple of years ago if she could tell me more about the twins. So uh, I wouldn't venture to do that. Maybe you can tell me more about it. I also brought my necklace. I have several necklaces that are native. It's a great necklace. I know, I love it. With little birds on it for something uh, that seemed very proper today about birds. Mm. Well, I'm making a lot of birds in my work, so that's why it's also proper. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I guess if I were making animals in my work, maybe I would have looked for something more animal-like. Um, so there's the twins, and there's the, um, well, the essence is really the spiritual part. Why, what is it all about? I mean, all these people making all these things, that never, they never connected to my heart. And maybe that's the other thing. So it's the spiritual part about what this is really all about. And I tell my daughter that life is a challenge. I mean, that's... <laughs> A big challenge because, you know, whenever we really get stuck, I mean, we see how much of a challenge it is, and it's irrational. The irrational part of living uh, is something manufactured, maybe, or is a section of it. Anyway, so the, all of those things, I don't want to ramble too long. Maria, maybe you just want to tell me about the twins, which you have was beautiful. Oh. I'll describe this, Jason, don't worry. Uh, okay, so I'm looking at uh, an amulet. Um, Nancy, where did you find this? Uh, well, I taught or in Minnesota for a long time. Um, uh, just weekly, and we, uh, bi-weekly or weekly programs um, at the University of Minnesota in Duluth. Okay. And so I became friends. Right. That's how I became friends with George Morrison okay. and his wife. Do you, and his do you know who made it? I don't, but I think it might be signed. Okay. I, that would be hard, probably, to it's, um, decipher the signature. Yeah, I think when we're looking at objects that, uh, first of all, I'm no authority on this. I'm not an um, <laughs> Anishinaabe <laughs> art historian, but I, I'll share what, I. what I do know here. And so I think a, a lot of objects that are collected are often made by women, and so they're unnamed. So mm -hmm. it's no surprise that we don't have a name on this. Although I'm sure if we were to go back to Duluth and Minnesota, we could quite easily um, trace um, the family where this item came from. But it's uh, a, a really beautiful medallion. I see peyote stitched. It's blue. There's two thunderbirds on two um, medallions that are hanging. I see quill work. I'm showing this to Chris, who's also an art historian and may um, have a take on it or want a closer look. Uh, my, uh, what strikes me about it is that it's blue and black. So those are really uh, men's colors. Um, and that there's two of them. And I, so I don't know so much about the twin, but it does to me call to mind the, the way that um, in Anishinaabe language, the little that I do know as a learner, that there's not gender specifiers. So when we say things, it's usually inclusive, and it could be either gender unless we're naming out male or female. So in that way, when I, I often, when we hear stories about Nana Bojo, that could be um, 
both male or female. So anyone can relate. It doesn't matter on how yeah. you identify. Sir? Am I not talking into the mic enough, Jason? Oh, yes, because I'm looking at this um, beautiful object that's in my hand here. Thank you for keeping an eye on that for me. Uh, but yeah, so I would say it comes back to balance, about maintaining balance. So if I was to be wearing this, I would be thinking about my own balance and living a life that is holistic, that is centered, that's not emphasizing the... Um, that is also one that centers spirit, body, mind, all those different components, and maintaining good relations with everything, with all of our living um, relatives, all living beings as well. Um, Thunderbird is also from the, the West, um, Sky World. So, yeah. All right, and so we go from Sky World, I guess, to the Lower East Side with uh, Stephen. So, you know, it's funny, as, as Nancy was telling me the story about living on Forsyth Street, uh, why don't you talk to me a little bit about how you ended up downtown and your existence, because I know, and, how, and also the building that you're currently living in now, and, and, and those kinds of things. Um, so, yeah, I guess in the early to mid-80s, I'd gotten involved with different activist groups on the Lower East Side, mm -hmm. and I was living in the neighborhood off and on throughout the 80s, sometimes on the Lower East Side or the East Village, sometimes on the Upper West Side, sometimes in Brooklyn. Uh, had a somewhat nomadic life at that point. It was actually a time in New York where you could actually, I mean, New York was still expensive, but you could move because you found a better opportunity. Like that would be your reason for moving, not because you had to, but you found a better situation to go to. <laughs> That's pretty rare. It doesn't really seem to happen so much anymore. Um, when I went to the, got to the Lower East Side, it was you know, much different than it is now. There were many more abandoned buildings. Um, Squatters were starting to take over buildings. The idea was that there's uh, the development of a big housing crisis and there were all these empty buildings. Almost all of them were owned by the city of New York at the time. The city was actually the biggest landlord in New York, not in the value of the properties, but in the number of units that it owned. In vast numbers, tens of thousands of units were vacant and idle. So that was the, depending on who you were talking to, the moral or ethical justification for expropriating a building and moving in was there's all these people who need homes, there's all these empty buildings, just do it. So depending on who you're talking to, if you're talking to church people, you might make it as a moral argument, and to secularists, you might make it as an ethical choice. Um, so that was sort of it when I went in. I mean, it was vastly different with the, with the, what the neighborhood is like now. Um, and Throughout the 80s, as people were doing it, it was almost like the, what I'd imagine the 60s were like and condensed within seven years in, you know, this tiny area of New York City from 14th Street to a couple blocks below Houston, from 3rd Avenue to Avenue D, um, where there was a great deal of political ferment. There were different factions within different groups of uh, activists and politics. There was right-wing pushback. Um, there was even like a, a crazed murderer in the neighborhood at the time, Daniel Rakowitz. It was sort of the local version of a Manson family. It was, you know, it, was, uh, it really was like the entirety of the late 50s to mid 70s condensed into seven years, culminating in, um, you know, a, a fairly big um, police military eviction of about five squatter buildings on 13th Street in 1995. Um, so, that was sort of, I'd gotten involved in activists in that area and started meeting artists who had a sort of instrumental view of uh, their work and they actually wanted to, to put their energies towards, uh, I guess we'd call agitprop. Mm -hmm. So I ended up coming into ABC No Rio with the sense of, like, not art for art's sake, but art as an instrument to be used for something else. Um, and then at the time, No Rio was getting closer tied to the squatters movement and street protest. Whereas before, the artists who founded ABC No Rio were, we described them as politically and socially engaged, but they did artwork that was political, but it wasn't necessarily work that was used by activists. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of the difference, where No Rio itself became more, the phrase I use is tied to the street. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so let's talk about ABC No Rio in terms of its ethos and, and, and its grounding. I, I know we don't have to get into the boilerplate because anyone can just Google it and just right. get the origins of it. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a writer and an article, I think, that's a good particular launching point for the ABC No Rio now of today. Um, you, would you give us some of that background? Well, I think um, you'd earlier asked about, you know, the importance of showing up. Yeah. And I, ABC No Rio, I mean, for people who are, want to participate, really requires that. So we use, you know, online instruments as tools, but to really, like, take part and to be able to will something of yourself into ABC No Rio through any of our projects actually requires being there. Mm -hmm. Like, you really do have to be there. But we pretty much tried to set up a collective framework where um, if you take part, you actually have a sense of ownership of the project or program in which you're involved. Um, we personally, and I think most of the people involved with No Rio, believe that actually one of the better ways to allow for individuals to express themselves is through a collective framework. So I th most people think of collectivism as an effort to sublimate somebody's individuality into like a diffuse body and we feel the opposite it's mm -hmm. like the collective framework is really a way for individuals to more freely express themselves and have a sense of ownership over the uh, processes of which they're a part mm -hmm. so even though my job title is director and abc no rio is organized as a corporation and there's a board of directors we've actually structured it so that um it is non-hierarchical right. and that um there are no program directors, for instance. The program director of every project or program at ABC No Rio is the collective of individuals involved in the project. Um, so that's sort of like the idea of how we should uh, sort of people manifest their will through these differing projects, whether it's doing the exhibitions, whether it's the punk concerts, the dark room that we were pro providing to photographers or the screen printing shop. Um, so I think really that's the, the core ethos, is this idea that individuals are best able to express themselves through a collective framework. Thanks, Stephen. Sure. Um, you, we, um, you also live in this place on Avenue C called Umbrella House. I know we had talked about that a while back, wasn't it? It has a, it has a history tied to indigenous New York. It does, it was actually a sort of place where well, there's a documentary that the Outfit Paper Tiger did about one individual. He's sad because he was an alcoholic. But um, it was sort of a, a house that um, Native people had squatted in the late 70s and early 80s. And um, a lot of them were um, people from upstate New York who were down here working in, on the, in the building trades. Um, and um, the... I don't know how it ended and I don't know how it began. We actually weren't able to find any history outside of this documentary that Paper Tiger had made about an individual who was living there who was having an extremely challenging time with alcoholism and drug addiction. And it sadly ends with his death. Um, so that's really all we know. We weren't, you know, there were a couple people who've lived at Umbrella House who actually tried to find further history about it. And even the people, they'd gotten in touch with the, the video maker who had done this documentary and they weren't actually able to, you know, provide much more information. I think it was actually a spontaneous documentary. They heard about this and then they went over there to film with the cooperation of the people who were living there. And um, they found this very interesting but tragic individual mm -hmm. that became the focus of the story. And... Um, Outside of that, I mean, we're not sure m much more about it. Only that, that before the current group of people who squatted the building, there was a, a group about five years earlier that had been there, uh, mostly Native people from, this fellow was from, I think, Oklahoma. But most of the people living there were from actually upstate New York, just like a lot of the, and a lot of them were, they, that's where they stayed when they were working on the buildings. I'm not sure how common it is anymore. So. Okay, and speaking of natives downtown, um, I, I'm going to talk about this book, but I wanted to ask you, Zenobia, when did you come to Harlem? When did you come to New York? Um, 74, So 74. Nancy, you've been here for, uh, since you were in Brooklyn, downtown in the 60s. And then Stephen, you came in the 80s, roughly. Right. Um, what at the time 
I mean, right now we're at a point where there seems to be a really good insurgence and people are much more well informed of indigenous presences. What are each of you, what are your takes of an indigenous presence um, back then? Were, were there, did you, was it visible? Was it invisible? Was it always after the fact? Did you, was it not even in, at all anything anyone was ever aware of with the communities that you operated in? And you guys can just speak up uh, my, as well, you like to. Yeah. Sure, mine had nothing to do with downtown though. There was actually this bar called Tin Pan Alley um, on, gosh, I can't remember what street it was, maybe 48th or 52nd Street. It was actually um, co-owned by the woman who ended up opening Max Fish and Tin Pan, no, she worked there. It was a, a woman who was a supporter of um, some black nationalist organizations. It was one of these bars that existed to raise money and all sorts of political activity went on there. But it was right off Times Square and it had the most amazing array of clientele from drag queens to prostitutes to music industry people to um, Native American men primarily who were hanging out there after work because they were, I don't know if it happens anymore, but they were here to work on the buildings. They were right. like the guys who were, they were iron trades guys. And that was my first sense of, you know, it was really, my first sense of it was seeing the reality of what previously had actually been a, a stereotype or a myth of native guys coming in town to work on the skyscrapers. And then I actually met native guys who came into town to work on the skyscrapers in this crazy bar and just off Times Square that had this most amazing array of people, which was probably a testament to the bar owner, Maggie, I can't remember her last name, I'm sorry. Um, who's herself like overlapped into all these disparate communities. Okay. Um, so that was really it. And um, outside of like the museum downtown, the Smithsonian, yeah. those were my two understandings of native people in New York. Thanks. Zenobia? Um, my experience with, I was really surprised to um, learn about the Shinnecock, you know, out on Long Island. Um, you know, I mean, New York is just blowing my mind. Um, but um, I, there's a few people that um, live in, well, Harlem too, they live in Harlem. But they're scattered around the, the Shinnecock. And um, I, you know, their food is so good. <laughs> When I went out there one time, their food is so good. But anyway, it's very soulful. Um, but um, that nation, I, I was um, exposed to them. Um, it's a African American and Native American um, community uh, living in Long Island, and um, it's really interesting because. Um, I can see the connection with um, urban and rural African American material culture and uh, homemaking in that community, you know, and um, I, I think that's about the 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 only one that I was in closer relationship with. Nice. The Thank you. Nancy, and also maybe I know you knew about Jim uh, Morrison, not Jim Morrison. Um, George Morrison. Whoops. Let's edit, let's edit that out. Um, Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison the, uh, the performer? Uh -huh. Well, isn't he from Seattle? I thought he was. Or spent a lot of time here. The possibility. Uh, everybody would just, leave Seattle. No, I was just I want, say that. Well, everybody, you know, that? wander. I mean, if you're curious and young, you wander around. Right, right. I mean, right. New York, I, where I grew up in Brooklyn, people didn't come to the city. Mm. Uh, they came twice a year. Christmas and Easter, and they come to see a show. I mean, you could have lived in Wisconsin. Of <laughs> all I know. Um, and I felt like that. So the minute I could leave, I left, because I wanted to see the world. Where, where did I see the world? In New York City, uh, mm -hmm. to begin with. But, you know, I was lucky because I was close. Um, but it was um, very, um, okay. but it was, it was very narrow in Brooklyn, New York. So it's not like, uh, I had an experience. I mean, I, when I taught on the Lower East Side many years ago, I, um, the um, after-school program is what I taught. And the uh, kids would come and work with me because they didn't like going to school. So I'd get them going on making art, and that's a good way for people to learn. Some of those kids I took up to Times Square at the end of the year or something. <laughs> They'd never seen anything like Times Square. They were three or four block 80s. radius. No, this was in the 60s. Oh, God. <laughs> Dangerous. I wouldn't know, but I've heard. 
Yeah. That's when I lived on Forsyth Street. It was well, I, I decided it was going to be tough. I was going to see the world. And my mother's protection and her tears um, <laughs> got to leave me colder and colder as that happened. I mean, there was, I, I'm not putting my mother down in the sense that she was right, it was dangerous. But I, I mean, how can you see the world if you only see a little piece of it? You know? Well, understand the world. I mean, not only see it, you want to understand something about it. Um, so what was our question Sorry, we, about we, the different places I've lived? I was I've just lived, curious why? about uh, your experience with indigenous peoples, maybe right oh, up to me. Yes. Um, yes. No, and, and then we'll, this will be the end of the segment, so you'll close us out. Oh, okay. Well, I, I married a Mexican-American um, who was very brown, um, and which, which uh, you know, a beautiful brown man, but his mother used to always, well, the reason why I'm saying this, Jason, and I'm sorry you're laughing about it, but I can understand. No, it's, it's uh, the reason why I'm saying this is because his mother and the whole family had a totemism, so did Italian-Americans. He was from California. And his mother used to say all the time when we were together, he's the darkest of all my children. Just like that. And I, I mean, what can you say to that? So that was the beginning of me learning about people of color. Uh, in a different way, because it did match the Italian-American totemism of color that I grew up with. But in New York City, uh, Native peoples and the, uh, the artist community, Native peoples and black peoples and a whole different spectrum of white people all hung out together on the Lower East Side. It was a real community. And they were all intermarried or had all kinds of relationships, friendships, romance, all of that. And that was a good part of the uh, experience of living on the Lower East Side in the 60s and 70s. Um, and then it began to break up because of the whole um, divisions that happened, all the divisions that happened uh, with uh, the um, country. You know, oh. The country's division broke. People began to take sides. But before then, it was a very nice community. And it was the first time I ever heard black poetry which to this day I can still hear in my ears because I had never heard language like that as poetry. Um, but Native American people specifically, um, as I said, I saw only a more of a mixed group of people. And of course, Mexican Indian uh, people and culture was, became important to me. But it felt right. It just matched. So Native people, um, I would go look at the museums. And that's how I got to know Native people. And then when I uh, taught in Minnesota, well, actually, uh, I don't know how much, how much time do we have. We want to wrap up. Okay. Well, I founded a feminist art institute, and Hazel Belva, who's married to George Morrison, who is an Ojibwe artist um, in Minnesota, uh, came to my workshop. And we had a great time together. And that's how I began to know George Morrison, who is a, quite a wonderful Ojibwe artist. He's passed now. He probably would be about 110, maybe 105 now. And um, that was my real introduction, a different kind of an immersion into something that I knew um, that I wouldn't, as I said, I wouldn't be an artist if I hadn't studied or looked at Native art. Wow, thank you. So thank you to all three of you for spending your time and joining us here. This segment was Downtown Stories, and I, I couldn't talk about Downtown Stories without also mentioning the book No Reservations, the New York Contemporary Native American Art Movement, uh, which is actually on sale here at Artist Space. So if you're coming by to see the exhibition, uh, maybe think about picking up this book. It tracks the contemporary indigenous artists from the 80s to now. Uh, I guess we'll move into some music, or we do, do we have a sponsorship? I'd just like to announce, um, first of all, our host for that segment was Karl May and the German hobbyists who love to play Indian. The Germans love Winnetou and Old Shatterhand. And the sponsor for that segment was Universal Healthcare, possible everywhere but the United States since 1980. With that, here's our <laughs> Hey, yo. 
Yeah.
forgiveness taking song in the name of nothing blood stained feet blood stained hair blood stained thighs blood stained palms blood stained bullets we feed on ghosts again in the name of nothing Nothing.